Because of its superior aerodynamics and sleek design, the Supermarine Spitfire became one of the iconic aircraft of World War II. Like the P-51 Mustang, this fighter came to define an era of courageous combat against desperate foes. The Supermarine Spitfire Design and Development Reginald Joseph Mitchell, a British aircraft designer for the Southampton Aviation Company Supermarine, began work on the forerunner of the Spitfire in 1931, when the Air Ministry called for a modern fighter capable of flying 250 miles per hour. Mitchell designed the Supermarine Type 224 to fill this role. Subscribe to our channel and get notification when we release new episodes. It was an open cockpit monoplane with bulky gull wings and a large fixed spatted undercarriage powered by the 600 horsepower Rolls-Royce Goshawk engine. The 224 used an experimental evaporative cooling system and problems with this system combined with the aircraft's disappointing performance led to it being rejected. This led to the Type 300 with retractable undercarriage and a wingspan reduced by six feet. This design was submitted to the Air Ministry in July 1934, but was not accepted. It then went through a series of changes, including incorporation of an enclosed cockpit, oxygen breathing apparatus, smaller and thinner wings, and the newly developed, more powerful Rolls-Royce PV-12 V-12 engine, later named the Merlin. In November 1934, Mitchell, with the backing of Supermarine's owner, Vickers Armstrong, started detailed design work on this refined version of the Type 300, resulting in prototype K-5054. In August 1933, Mitchell had undergone a colostomy to treat rectal cancer, but continued to work on the Spitfire. Unusual for an aircraft designer in those days, he took flying lessons and got his pilot's license in July 1934. The cancer returned two years later, and Mitchell was unable to attend the Spitfire's maiden flight, but he was often seen watching the plane fly from his garden in nearby Russell Place, Portswood, Southampton. He died in 1937, and his successor, Joe Smith, developed the fighter to make it faster and more powerful. On March 5, 1936, K-5054 took off from Eastleigh Aerodome, piloted by Captain Joseph Mutt Summers, with this flight, a legend was born. The first true flight of the Vickers Supermarine Spitfire came just four months after the maiden flight of what is considered to be its partner aircraft, the Hawker Hurricane. Development of the Spitfire continued with the first undercarriage retraction on March 10, 1936, and trials of different propellers in order to increase maximum speed. The shape of the wing and all of the compound curves on the airplane made it beautiful, said Alex Spencer, curator of British and European military aircraft at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. However, that beauty came at a price. It was an extremely complicated aircraft to build. There was delay after delay on delivery, but they got the bugs worked out of production and ready for the conflict they all knew was coming. The British public first saw the Spitfire at the Royal Air Force RAF Hendon Air Display on June 27, 1936, but the first production Spitfire, K-9787, did not roll off the Woolston-Southampton assembly line until mid-1938. As a result of the delays in getting the Spitfire into full production, the Air Ministry put forward a plan that its production be stopped after the initial order for 310 but managements of Supermarine and Vickers were able to convince the Air Ministry that production problems could be overcome, and an order for 200 more Spitfires was placed on March 24, 1938. A production aircraft cost about 9,500 pounds. The most expensive components were the hand-fabricated and finished fuselage at roughly 2,500 pounds, then the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine at 2,000 pounds followed by the wings at 1,800 pounds a pair, guns and undercarriage, both at 800 pounds each, and the propeller at 350 pounds. Armament In April 1935, 
The planned armament was changed from two 303-inch Vickers machine guns in each wing to four 303-inch Mark II Brownings. Early tests showed that while the guns worked perfectly on the ground and at low altitudes, they tended to freeze at high altitude, especially the outer wing guns because the RAF's Brownings had been modified to fire from an open bolt. While this prevented overheating of the cordite used in British ammunition, it allowed cold air to flow through the barrel unhindered. Supermarine did not fix the problem until October 1938, when it added hot air ducts from the rear of the wing-mounted radiators to the guns and bulkheads around the gun bays to trap the hot air in the wing. Red fabric patches were doped over the gun ports to protect the guns from the cold, dirt, and moisture until they were fired. Even if the eight Brownings worked perfectly, Pilots soon discovered that they were not sufficient to destroy larger aircraft. Combat reports showed that an average of 4,500 rounds were needed to shoot down an enemy aircraft. In June 1939, a Spitfire was fitted with a drum-fed Hispano autocannon in each wing, an installation that required large blisters on the wing to cover the 60-round drum. However, the Hispanos, which had originally been designed and produced by Spanish-French company Hispano Suiza in the mid-1930s were found to be very unreliable. So, by August 1940, Supermarine had perfected a more reliable installation with an improved feed mechanism and four Browning machine guns in each outer wing panel. Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain Because of its superior aerodynamics and sleek design, the Supermarine Spitfire became one of the iconic aircraft of World War II. Like the P-51 Mustang, this fighter came to define an era of courageous combat against desperate foes, though it required far more development than other airplane designs. By the outbreak of the war in September 1939, nine squadrons were equipped with the Spitfire model Mark I. In spite of vigorous demands from the French, the Commander-in-Chief of Fighter Command refused to send any Spitfires to France during the German Blitzkrieg of May and June 1940. The wisdom of that decision would soon be clearly shown. The Spitfire was desperately needed to fly support missions to protect the British Expeditionary Force and what was left of the French Army as they huddled on the cold and windswept sands of Dunkirk. From May 23 to June 4, 1940, Spitfires flew countless sorties against Messerschmitts, Stukas, and other German planes as they tried to destroy Allied troops trapped on those beaches. In one mission over the coast of Dunkirk, Flight Lieutenant Robert Stanford Tuck shot down one Messerschmitt BF-110, narrowly avoided a collision with another of the twin-engine fighters, and then was closing in on a third quarry when he realized he was flying directly toward electrical wires. With lightning reflexes, he pulled up on his controls. The lithe and agile Spitfire responded instantly, and Tuck narrowly avoided the death trap. He regained composure, throttled up his powerful Merlin engine, and zoomed back on the tail of the BF-110. He pulled the trigger and sent a short burst from his eight Brownings into the German fighter, causing it to crash. Tuck quickly became a British hero as he shot down five German planes in two days, to earn his ace designation. His exploits and those of other Spitfire pilots likely saved tens of thousands of Allied soldiers at Dunkirk from death or confinement in POW camps for the duration of the war. By July 1940, RAF Fighter Command had 19 Spitfire squadrons available, but Britain stood alone against the might of the Nazi war machine. Hitler sent 2,600 Luftwaffe fighters and bombers to destroy the Royal Air Force in what would be known as the Battle of Britain. German commander Hermann Göring confidently predicted victory would only take a few days. At the start of the battle, the RAF only had 640 fighters, Hurricanes and Spitfires. The Hurricane actually outnumbered the Spitfire through the battle and shouldered the burden of the defense against the Luftwaffe, but because of its higher performance, the overall attrition rate of the Spitfire squadrons was lower than that of the Hurricane units, and the Spitfire units had a higher victory-to-loss ratio. By the end of the battle in October, the better-organized RAF had defeated the Luftwaffe 
and downed 1,887 German planes. The RAF lost 1,023 planes. Other action in World War II After its failure to destroy the RAF in 1940, the Luftwaffe turned mainly to bombing of British industrial and civilian targets, which continued to May 1944. In late 1941, the German FW-190 was introduced, which outperformed the Spitfire. However, the newer model Spitfire Mark IX restored parity the following year and eventually regained the advantage. It remained a first-line air-to-air fighter throughout the war. One of the Spitfire's most important contributions to Allied victory was as a photo reconnaissance aircraft from early 1941. Superior high-altitude performance rendered it all but immune to interception, and the fuel tanks that replaced wing-mounted machine guns and ammunition bays gave it sufficient range to probe Western Germany from British bases, sometimes unarmed. It flew at high, medium, and low altitudes, often ranging far into enemy territory to provide an almost continual flow of valuable intelligence information throughout the war. In 1941 and 1942, photo reconnaissance Spitfires provided the first photographs of the German Freya and Würzburg radar systems. In 1943, their aerial photos helped confirm that the Germans were building the V-1 and V-2 Vergeldenswaffen, vengeance weapons, at Pinamunda on the Baltic Sea coast of Germany. In late 1943, Spitfires powered by Rolls-Royce Griffin engines developing as much as 2,050 horsepower began entering service, capable of top speeds of 440 miles per hour and ceilings of 40,000 feet. These were used not only to observe, but to shoot down the V-1 buzz bombs that began to hit England in June 1944. Malta was a key strategic Allied base in World War II. Axis forces laid siege to the island and attacked British supply ships. By 1942, supplies in Malta were running low. The RAF called for reinforcements, and over the summer, hundreds of Spitfires were shipped in by aircraft carriers. The plane proved decisive in gaining air superiority. The siege was broken, and Malta became an important base for supplying British troops in Africa and launching future attacks on Italy. In June 1944, Spitfires played an important part in the biggest seaborne invasion in history as the Allies landed at Normandy and gained a crucial foothold in France. The fighters provided strong air support for the D-Day landings, and many were adapted as fighter bombers to carry out attacks on German ground forces. The Spitfire also served on the Eastern Front with the Soviet Air Force. While some aircraft were used for frontline duty in 1943, most saw service with the Anti-Air Defense Branch. A total of 1,185 Mark IX aircraft were delivered through Iran, Iraq, and the Arctic to northern Soviet ports. Meanwhile, the 4th Fighter Group of the United States Army Air Forces used the Spitfire until it was replaced by the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt in March 1943. In the Pacific Theater, the Spitfire sometimes met the Japanese Mitsubishi A6M Zero. Although not as fast, the Zero could outturn the Spitfire, could sustain a climb at a very steep angle, and could stay in the air for three times as long. The Allies achieved air superiority when the Spitfire Mark VIII version was introduced. Final Use Spitfires remained in RAF service after the end of World War II. On February 5, 1952, a Spitfire of the 81st Squadron, based at Kai Tak in Hong Kong, reached probably the highest altitude ever achieved by a Spitfire. The pilot, Flight Lieutenant Edward Ted Paulus, climbed to 50,000 feet indicated altitude with a true altitude of 51,550 feet. The cabin pressure fell below a safe level, and in trying to reduce altitude, Paulus entered an uncontrollable dive that shook the aircraft violently. He eventually regained control somewhere below 3,000 feet and landed safely with no discernible damage to his aircraft. Evaluation of the recorded flight data 
suggested he achieved a speed of 690 miles per hour, Mach 0.96 in the dive, which would have been a record for the highest speed ever reached by a propeller-driven aircraft had the instruments been considered more reliable. In the late 1940s and 1950s, Spitfires were purchased and used extensively by the air forces of many nations, including France, the Netherlands, Sweden, Italy, Greece, Turkey, India, and Burma. In an odd twist, during the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 to 1949, Spitfires from both sides engaged one another over Israel and the Egyptian Sinai. The last RAF Spitfire military mission was on April 1, 1954, when the aircraft was used for photographic reconnaissance in Malaysia, searching for communist guerrillas. However, the Spitfire continues to fly with the RAF today as part of the aerial displays of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. If you like these types of videos, subscribe to our channel and get notification when we release new episodes. For more interesting military history content, check out our video library.